On episode 570 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Stuart Sandeman and discuss his book, Breathe In, Breathe Out, Restore Your Health, Reset Your Mind, and Find Happiness Through Breath Work. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 570. If you decided you're ready to make a change to reclaim your health and fitness, the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. Each week, we dive deep into health and fitness topics that affect those of us over 40. I'm Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with specializations in corrective exercise, behavior change, and fitness nutrition, a FAI certified functional aging specialist, and an OTA level two online trainer. I'm joined each week by our co-host, Rachel Everett. She is an NASM certified personal trainer and a RRCA level one run coach. Let us be your coaches as you find your way on your health and fitness journey, all right? Let's go. I remember one New Year's Day when I launched off on a series of resolutions that would fix everything that was broken in my life. I was going to stop snacking, quit drinking alcohol, drink plenty of water, exercise every day, and call my mother at least once a week. That lasted all of three weeks, which begs the question, do you set resolutions each year? Or have you given up on the notion that you could ever stick to it? Do you wonder why it's so hard to start making a change and equally as hard to keep going? The fitness industry loves this. They want you to get a gym membership and not use it. They want you to buy their packaged weight loss food and not lose weight. That's their entire business model. In fact, they want us to believe just long enough to get our credit card or bank details. But I'm here to tell you, all you need is to set your feet and have a plan. Tom Landry, the legendary coach of the Dallas Cowboys, said, setting a goal is not the main thing. It is deciding how to go about achieving it and staying with that plan. Or as Abraham Lincoln said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four hours sharpening the axe. I prefer to say it this way. You may know how to drive, but without knowing the route, you'll never arrive. You're closer than you think, and I have full faith that you can get there this year. I'm doing a workshop on January 1st called the Better Me Tomorrow Workshop. This is a live, done-with-you program that takes you step-by-step through setting your route to transformation in 2023. Learn more at BetterMeTomorrow.com. That's BetterMeTomorrow.com. I'm looking forward to working with you at the live Better Me Tomorrow Workshop on January 1st. BetterMeTomorrow.com. Hello, Raz. How are you? Good, Alan. How are you today? I'm doing well. Good. So um, you got some stuff to tell us. I do. I do. I just, (laughs) I'm so happy and grateful to report that my husband is doing well after his surgery. They removed his kidney, um, adrenal gland, and a bunch of lymph nodes. And we got the all clear report. Every, all the margins were clear. The lymph nodes were clear. So technically, my husband is 100% cancer-free right now. We're yeah. grateful for all the support and prayers from our friends and in, in the community. And moving forward, we know he'll have immunotherapy still with our oncologist, but I expect to hear even more good news from him when we get to see him in about another week or so. So yeah. it's all good. And for for Mike, ice fishing is right around the corner. It is. It is. <laughs> yep. He needs to sit still and let this giant incision heal. It's a pretty big one. And uh, he needs to sit still, let it heal, and he'll be all set to go. The lakes are freezing over as we speak. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Yep. He'll be chomping at the bit to get out there. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I had an interesting weekend. Um, Saturday, we had a 5K uh, here in oh. Bocas. It's the first one I've it's the first one I've seen in four years, and I don't, you know, oh, I don't know how cool. far I have it. But there's apparently a running organization in Panama, and so they put this on, and there were prizes. So people came in from all over Panama to compete for this oh, thing. So neat. this was not, this was not necessarily intended to be an amateur uh, run, uh, but I was. Um, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, I was the penultimate uh, finisher. 
which was fine. I finished it and uh, had a good time. It was, nice. it was enjoyable. But th- what was cool was, is this was they scheduled it for three o'clock in the afternoon. Huh. And that's so interesting. I'm like, you know, yeah, it's like the hottest part of the day. But as as fate would have it, shining down on everybody, it's like it was maybe. 79 degrees. So the temperature oh. was probably about five to seven degrees cooler than it normally would have been. It's oh, actually a little bit chilly. Um, oh my gosh. Sitting there in my tank top <laughs> and shorts. I'm kind of like, wow. you know, I got to move around a little bit here to stay warm. Cause yes, I've definitely acclimated to the warmer weather, mm-hmm. uh, but it was a nice little run out and back, um, you know, to a spot. And um, so, yeah, a really cool little run. I used the, the Jeff Galloway, you know, run, walk, run. Cool. Uh, which surprised a lot of people because almost no one else really walked. Uh, you know, they're all going to do their little run and then slow down as they go and get slower sure. and slower and slower. So for me, it was like, okay, I'll go for a little bit. It's like, okay, I'm hitting that that threshold and I'll do a little bit of walk. I didn't do the timing of it and all that. I just, mm-hmm. okay, just just go ahead and don't go for a, a moment here, get to a point when I feel like it's necessary, mm-hmm. let myself down and speed myself up. And nice. so I, I hit my marks, you know, I didn't really time Good. myself, but I kind of know, okay, I want to run about half of it if I, you know, and I want to walk about half of it. And sure. Sure. That's really kind of how I, I ran my race and awesome. I felt good about it. And, good. you know, it was a lot of fun and they had prizes for people. So like I said, it was a lot of people were excited and they, were, they had, a, they had a, a kid's fun run. It was a 1K, Aww. two age divisions. And the kids got money too, which was oh, neat. You know, these kids were just ecstatic to do this little race oh, and for sure. you know, win some money out of it. And then, uh, so I, they probably got runners for life on this island now. Oh. And then, you know, cause yeah, you little kid, you went 25 bucks running a 1K. Hey. Uh, yeah. That's good money. That's good money there. Um, that's awesome. <laughs> and then, yeah, there's top prize for the, for the men's and for the women's are five places, like 125 all the way down to wow. 60. And nice. it's like $15 to sign up. So, I mean, like literally, yeah, these guys are, are getting a haul for their money. And then there's a relay. And so a lot of the guys from Panama, a lot of folks from Panama City came in and took most of their award money back home. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it was still fun. And then awesome. um, they had a uh, fundraiser for the, the spay and neuter uh, group uh, called Papagato here. And something I sort of got roped into last year and went along with was being Santa. Aww. On the so I was the Santa. I led the parade of the pets, Aww. walking their pets down to the location. And then we did um, uh, get your picture taken with Santa. So all the dogs and the people and did a little, you know, little fundraiser there. And nice. so overall, yeah, we raised about 1200 bucks for, um, wow. they were doing other stuff. They were selling stuff and, you know, so proceeds from a lot of different things went into this. So, but, so I was, I was a part of it. I think um, the report I got was that we pulled about $200 for Santa sitting. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Way to go. That's so cool. Yeah. It got kind of raunchy at the end, but um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, it was all, all good fun and um, good. making some money for, for a good cause as the Spain New awesome. on these islands. So yeah, very interesting, active uh, weekend for me, but uh, that sounds great. Good. sounds like a lot of fun. All right. And a lot of breathing. So um, oh. you ready to talk <laughs> about breathing with Stuart? Sure. That sounds great. All right, here we go. Our guest today is a globally recognized breathing expert performance coach, and radio DJ. He is the founder of BreathPod, which helps individuals and groups reach their full potential through the power of breathing. A Scottish judo champion, former financier, and music producer, he came to breathwork after losing his girlfriend to cancer at the age of just 31. He trained as a respiratory coach, studying Eastern methodologies and Western science. His distinctive approach, rooted in his winning mindset, experience of loss, and practical outlook, is designed to disrupt negative thought patterns, beliefs, and habits so people can gain a healthier perspective on how they live. He has since helped transform the lives of thousands of people working with businesses such as Google, Nike, and Spotify, as well as Olympic athletes and creative artists. His work has been featured in numerous publications, including The Times, The Evening Standard, and The Guardian. With no further ado, here is Stuart Sandeman. Stuart, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, now the book is Breathe In, Breathe Out, Restore Your Health, Reset Your Mind, and Find Happiness Through Breathwork. And... You touched me on a lot of different ways uh, in that one little title and subtitle. 
And and I think as I was going through it and kind of reading the book and and getting into it and and particularly your story, which I want you to get to in a minute, but it was just repeated realization of how important breath is to every single process in our entire body that without a breath, we have nothing to look forward to, (laughs) (laughs) but with a breath, we have everything to look forward to. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not only does breathing bring life into our body, but it's, it triggers our state of being. It it affects how we feel, how we think, how all, all our system works. And it's it's such an amazing tool that we all have. And once we know how to use it, we can empower ourselves to make positive change in all facets of our well-being, and from physical health to mental health, emotional health, um, and even spiritual health as well. So it's it's really a, a fantastic tool, and I'm so glad we get to chat about it today. Yes. Now, you know, you brought up in the book that, you know, we were born, of course, there's, you know, maybe the slap on the bottom that we hear about so often, and then we take our first breath. And from that point forward, as babies, we're we're doing a pretty good job of breathing. And then we sort of along the way, forget how to breathe right. And other things get in our lives and kind of affect our breathing and change our breathing. And we can't be many of us become very bad at breathing. And, and you're not someone who just remembered it as a baby. You had to relearn a lot of these things too. Can you tell us a little bit about what triggered you to get into breath work as a tool, as a way of life? Mm. Yeah, I think just to, to reiterate, baby babies are the breathing gurus. That's what I always <laughs> say. If you spot a baby breathe, everything's kind of working as it should, unless there's been a complication, of course, but we're all perfect breathers. And it's then the life experiences, the stress, the um, emotions where our breathing starts to constrict and we form these bad habits of breathing. And it can be physical. It could be things like posture or um, clothing choice can even affect our breathing. And I wasn't ever aware. And I'd gone through my life running around, pretty busy, uh, too busy to breathe, for sure, whether my background was in sport um, and then I I was in in judo. I was on a judo mat at four years old and and had dreams of being an Olympic champion, but through injury, I was Scottish champion for many years, but through injury, um, I couldn't pursue that any longer and ended up working in finance and a very fast-paced, dynamic world, finances, and very stressful moments. Nobody ever taught me to breathe then either. My breathing was probably completely out of whack. I left my finance job and and after signing some record deals and started touring the world as a DJ, so quite a jump from kind of sports to corporate to very creative. And again, nobody taught me to breathe or I, I didn't know the tool that I could have to manage myself, whether that was practical things like jet lag or nerves before gigs and what got me into breathing was actually through grief i probably wouldn't have listened like i said before if somebody had said look at your breath i I wasn't on my radar at all but my girlfriend was diagnosed with terminal cancer and when she passed away all that happened was i took my mum for mother's day to a breathing class my mum is into breathing my mum mum's a yoga instructor so i popped up online last minute. And I thought, mom, will love that. And it was when I was still in my grieving process, I was in a pretty bad headspace at that time. And yeah, I went along to this breathing class, not really knowing what to expect. I was kind of just there for my mom. And I had a very powerful experience, a very cathartic experience, a lot of emotion um, stirred. And my breath felt like I, I released my breath for the first time ever. And it wasn't until I did it that I realized I'd been carrying this tension around for not just through grief. It was amplified a hundredfold through grief, but it was more than that. So that's that's how I initially kind of entered the space of breath work. Um, it has become more of a commonly used term or phrase, but at that time it wasn't very widespread. And I thought, right, okay, well, what has happened? Because my experience not only was very physical, it was extremely emotional, but also I felt that like my girlfriend was there holding my hand, which 
didn't make any sense to me in my mind. Um, so I thought, right, okay, what was that? What just happened? The I really wanted to know as much as I could. So dive back in to do another session as soon as I could to figure out what if that was a one off, if it was if I was going completely mad, if it was uh, something else. And lo and behold, I had another powerful experience. Same, different, but similar, but different. And the more I practiced, the more I uncovered, the more I realized about myself, my breath, the more my energy shifted, my voice in my head became kinder. I was flying up the leaderboard at CrossFit gym. Um, and the difference was so a lot of physical differences, but a lot of mental, emotional differences. And it felt like I was like this change, this upgrade was happening. And a big part was that we're, we're working through grief and, and helping myself move through that and empowering myself to move through that, through something so simple as breathing. So that was when I first realized that there was this very powerful tool that we all have called breathing. And that was one form of breathing, one type of breathing that is used to uncover, uh, release emotion, let go of tension. And from that point, I thought, well, what else is out there for breathing? Um, how, how are people, what are, the, what are the different ways we can breathe? And what does that mean to our physical body, our energy levels, our stress levels? How are people breathing? How are athletes breathing? Are they breathing optimally for their sport? So I went off to kind of discover as much as I possibly could and learn as much as I could about breathing because it helped me so much. And I thought if it could help me, well, it could help a lot of other people. And initially after that first breathing session, I, I had a list of people. I was like, my dad needs to come and do this. Uh, my friend, <laughs> so-and-so needs to do it. Someone else needs to do it. And I had this list of people. Like, right, okay, they all need to do it, but I'm not sure they would connect with the way it was currently that, at that time being delivered. And so I thought, well, let's let's find out as much as I could and try and bridge the gap between the kind of scientific approach, but also this amazing magic that can happen in these sessions. And that's what I think is very interesting. So kind of figuring out what is happening as best as we can, but then also being open to explore what we're not quite sure is happening in these sessions. Yeah, I, I'm probably a lot more like the people you're talking about where I'm I'm gonna need to see a little bit of science before. I decide I'm gonna I'm gonna give this a go. Uh, you know, not that not, uh, not that woo woo doesn't have a place, but <laughs> <laughs> we've got to have a little bit of science behind it. And that is that is me all over. And I think I'd live my life science, logic, mind. Um, I did maths at university and and went off and, and worked in kind of finance and and that what my my brain couldn't comprehend. What had happened in that session? Was my girlfriend there holding my hand? Or was that my imagination? And trying to figure that question out, a big question to ask, because I'm not sure anyone's got the answer for it yet. But we can start to look at, well, what is happening in the body when we breathe in certain ways? How is it possible to reach a state where we have an experience that isn't easy to quantify through science? There's a lot of breathwork practices we can quantify very much so. Uh, especially the sports side of things as well, when we're looking at the body and, and performance, because we can measure performance and VO2 max and, and these interesting parameters. But with the more emotional side, it's a it's it's a little bit trickier to to quantify, but it's still a very valid space to explore. Yeah, and and to me, I guess, and this was in the book, the big tie-in here is this uh, this part of our body or brain really that's called the autonomic nervous system. Mm. And that's how, at least how I kind of visualized it as I went through your book and I was thinking about this. And I think most people would think of this as, oh, this is either the fight or flight mode or the I'm relaxed and chilling and, and enjoying my life right now, sitting by a, you know, beautiful lake watching, you know, frogs or whatever. Um <laughs> Can you talk about the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, and how those play into breathing? Yeah, absolutely, because it's such a key factor. So the autonomic nervous system is split in two halves. We've got our kind of on switch, our sympathetic drive, and it's our stress response. You said the fight or flight response. Fire flight response is often deemed as a very negative response because everyone's 
so stressed. We're trying to get rid of that the whole time. But in essence, every in-breath is going to switch us on. Heart rate will go up. Blood pressure will go up. Um, our sympathetic drive is kicks in. So how we're breathing really affects that on switch. And when we're switched on, our blood flow moves to our muscles and gets us ready to act. We are motivated and ready for action. So that happens every time we breathe in. If we breathe faster, it's going to happen even more. Sometimes we click into that state, the, the fight or flight response, when we, if we walk outside and wander off the pavement onto the road and didn't see our car was coming, we see the car, we take a big gasp of air <gasps> and jump back off to the pavement. So that sympathetic mode is there to keep us safe and protect us from any type of danger. It's what we've had for thousands of years. I like to think of it as the best friend that is always looking out for you, saying, watch out for this, look out for that, <laughs> let's get going, um, which I guess is a nicer than, than, than sort of saying the fight or flight response, this negative thing. It's actually a very positive thing. Then we have our the other side, the rest, digest, the parasympathetic mode. I always think sympathetic, S for stress, parasympathetic, P for peace. And the parasympathetic mode is is really about conserving energy slowing things down, moving our blood flow to our digestion, our reproductive organs, where we can start to repair and digest our food and get some good rest. And this is like the best friend that is saying, calm down, relax, digest your food, get some sleep. So we have this interplay in every breath cycle. We breathe in, sympathetic goes up, breathe out, sympathetic, uh, parasympathetic sl- happens when we slow our breath down and, and breathe out. So how we breathe really triggers each one of these divisions. Are we more switched on or are we more switched off? And when I say switched off, it's, it's more about calming this, this relaxation response. So it's quite binary in its direction. How we're breathing, where we're breathing, where our breath is flowing. Am I breathing in a certain way that's going to drive my sympathetic mode, which is creating this stress response? Or am I breathing in a way that's going to calm my body and mind? So that's pretty much how how breathing interplays with that. And um, because that interplays with our stress, our energy, our um, focus, our relaxation, our sleep, our digestion, when we understand how we're breathing and how we're breathing in different situations or scenarios, well, we can start to take control of some of those responses because we can control our breath. Now that for me, is such a powerful thing because no longer is it I'm just at the mercy of um, being reactive to the world around me. Yes, the world is still happening around you, but you can start to take control of how you feel. You can start to take control of how your body is responding so that you can respond instead of react. You can calm yourself in those stressful moments. You can invigorate yourself in those lulls where you're feeling exhausted and you don't want to have the fifth cup of coffee, Well, you can create a bit of ooh stress, positive stress to motivate you. Or you can start to balance out on and off. And when I say balance out, when we have this kind of equal in-breath and out-breath ratio, then we start to have coherence between our heart rhythms and from our heart to our brain so we can access more flow states where we're feeling um, on and off in equal measure. We're feeling energized, focused, relaxed, and able to go through tasks or go through the day feeling at ease with with everything that's going on. Prior to reading this book, I really kind of thought there were really sort of four different ways to breathe, and really they were just opposites of each other. So maybe not even four, but just how we happen to be breathing at the time. There were nose breathers and mouth breathers. Uh, my German shepherd's a mouth breather, um, <laughs> but that's how she cools herself off. So what am I going to say? And then there was uh, whether you breathe deep or whether you'd breathe shallow. And so to me, that that was the only dynamics I really thought about with regards to breath. But in the book, you took this out and kind of broke it into seven breathing archetypes. And I think Mm. those are really important because once you kind of know your, uh, I guess, the basis, like where you are today, it kind of gives you like a, a starting point of knowing, okay, I'm not breathing deep enough, or I'm not breathing this way, or I have a tendency to breathe that way. And you can start working on it. If you don't know what the problem is, you can't really fix it, so to speak. So could you talk about the seven archetypes? Yeah, the breathing archetypes is the common breathing patterns that people fall into, the breathing types. And we all have 
an archetype. Sometimes we're a combination of two archetypes or three archetypes, or sometimes we fall into a pattern of archetype in a certain situation. So the archetypes that um, I share is, is the first one is the chest breather. Are we breathing dominantly in our chest, which means that we're not using our primary breathing muscle. We're using our chest muscles or intercostal muscles. And the pure mechanics of a chest breather means it's shorter, it's shallower. We're breathing in more air, in and out, a bit quicker. So the chest breather is ringing the alarm bell to our brain to say we're under stress. The fight or flight response has kicked in. Now, if that becomes the archetype, that means that that stressful day has probably become a stressful week, has probably become a stressful year, and we've been we're stuck in that breathing pattern. And not only is it the mechanics that play into some of these patterns, these archetypes, it's also the chemistry of the body. Because when we breathe, it's really about the body finding homostasis between the chemistry, the, the pH levels. And if we're having a stressful day, then the brain is perceiving that the interesting thing about a mind is it triggers the same breath response, whether there's a threat in the environment, so the tiger in the room, or the tiger in our mind triggers the same breathing response. doesn't matter if it's a thought, a perceived thought, or an actual experience happening. The breathing happens the same. So for the chest breather, something can happen in their experience. And if they're stressed a lot of the day, then carbon dioxide drops because they're breathing too fast. And the body doesn't like the change of pH. So what it does is it holds on to acidity and rebalances the pH level at the cost of keeping the breath fast. So it's like we find a new normal of breathing. So often the chest breather has this kind of fast, too fast. We're creating stress in the body. It becomes normal because our body tries to balance this out with homostasis and uh, with its pH, and we get stuck in this archetype. So that's that's the first one is the chest breather. It's quite common. It's probably one of the more common ones I see. And it takes a little bit of, practice just to get the diaphragm engaged and opening up downwards, which is our primary breathing muscle, so that we can start breathing with it and feeling that lower torso flow um, before the chest. So that's, yeah, we've got the chest breather. The next one is the reverse breather. Reverse breather, if you imagine breathing in, and if you're listening, you can try it as well. As you breathe in, you may see your belly rise first or your chest rise first. So the chest breather is breathing up in the chest first. The reverse breather is quite similar, but it's a more of a seesaw action. So when they breathe in, the belly goes back and the chest goes out. And when they breathe out, it kind of collapses back the other way. So like it says on the on the description, reverse breathing is, is kind of like having our breathing going back to front. And when we have our breathing back to front, it's like our basic form of movement. So it's it confuses the body. It's a bit like having your trousers on back to front. If it's uncomfortable for the body, but again, the body gets used to it. And we think this is normal. We're just feeling this way all the time. We're not sure why we're lack of energy or we can't sleep properly or different effects that will happen when we have the, the reverse breathing archetype. The collapse breather is, is one of the other ones. We've got collapse breather is basically often posturally caused. A lot of these are actually from posture as well. If you've got tight jeans, high-waisted jeans, tight belts on, a bra that doesn't fit, we we can create a lot of these archetypes just by the restrictions that we put on ourselves. Sat at our desk all day, driving too much in the car. So the collapse breather is often postural. Shoulders are hunched around. And when we're hunching our shoulder, we're actually just collapsing their breath. The mechanics, again, is, is not allowing this natural flow. And each of these archetypes will trigger, because our brain triggers our body to breathe, and our breath pattern sends a signal back to our brain. And our brain is about thinking, and our breath and our body is about feeling. Then it changes the way we're thinking and feeling when we fall into some of these archetypes. Where do we get to? We've got the chest, we've got the reverse, we've got the collapse, frozen breather. Frozen breather is, if you imagine going out on a cold day and how we, and we didn't have a jacket on and we kind of start to close up, it's like the whole body constricts. Some people have an archetype where their body's constricted. They're kind of in this frozen state. And they're not actually breathing much at all. So they're not getting this natural flow of air in and out. So they're not kind of allowing this natural resource for energy to happen. They just got this very, very frozen style of breathing, which will affect 
their body and mind again differently. Breath grabber is our next one. Now the breath grabber, we'll all have, all have met them before. It's often when somebody is grasping for air. You can usually find it in conversations. The breath grabber is trying to grab grab that air. So it might be they'll be butting in and trying to get the point across and speaking quite fast and in between breaths, gra- gasping for breath in through their mouth. So you might find that kind of hyperactive person often breath grabbing. And for all these archetypes, when we start looking at somebody breathe, their breathing pattern, if you mirror their breathing pattern, say, well, what's happening with their breathing? Well, if we say those in words, that's probably how they're thinking and feeling. So if we've got the breath grabber, it's a pace that they're living, very busy, a lot going on. So the breath grabber is like that. We also have the breath controller. Now, the breath controller is, at first sight, the breathing looks pretty good. The breath controller tends to be about this out-breath being very controlled. And in some ways, it's an all right architect because the breath controller, harder to spot, but their breath is so controlled because they're trying to control everything around them. And the nature of the world that we live in, yes, it's great to have control sometimes, but we can't control everything. It's like trying to control the Scottish weather or any weather, (laughs) but we just can't. Um, But the breath controller wants to have that control the whole time. So often find with the breath controller, with the breath being controlled, all these other things they find when they don't have control, it, it causes them to feel pretty uncomfortable. That, so that might be things like flying. If somebody's got a fear of flying, it might be because they don't have that control anymore and their breath could be a part of that controller pattern. And then the other archetype I put in there um, was actually the perfect breather. And I know he said m- most people have dysfunctional breathing patterns, but I thought I'd say the, the perfect breather is kind of a trick question uh, or a trick archetype because the perfect breather really depends on what we're doing. Because if we're running for a bus, our breathing is going to be very different from sat, in, sat still or being in our bed and relaxing or watching TV or you mentioned sitting watching the frogs. They, but when I talk about perfect breathing, I usually look across five different areas. It's really important to make sure that we have our natural resting breath, meaning when there's no threat in our environment and we are sat going about our business, feeling relaxed thinking relaxed, that our breathing is operating as optimally as it can. In and out through our nose, using our diaphragm, slow, gentle, flowing, um, steady. And then from there, we can start looking at these other areas. So breathing at rest, we've got breathing and sleeping is a big one. Breathing and whenever whatever we're doing throughout the day. So that might be at work or um, studies or Whatever happens throughout your day, mainly our breathing tends to change from when we're at rest and then we're out and about in our day. The next one is is linked to that is breathing and speaking. A lot of people switch to mouth breathing when they speak, that breath grabber style, but a lot of people end up doing it. So what I mean by that is we'll speak, 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 and breathe in through the mouth. Now the mouth breath is that trigger for stress, like stepping off the road into the oncoming traffic. So I find that if we were doing a job, maybe a sales role, or we talk a lot on the phone, or throughout our day, just talking a lot, a lot, of, nine people out of 10 will start becoming the breath grabber in those moments. So making sure that we're breathing and speaking effectively, using our nose to breathe in between senses, it's quite hard to change. And then the final one, which is a bit more of the advanced side, is how are we breathing when we are doing physical exercise, when we are kind of increasing that respiratory rate um, for whatever given sport or exercise we're doing, whether that is walking or whether that's something more intense. So they're the kind of five areas, but it all happens or it begins with breathing at rest. You talked a little bit about back and forth about breathing through your nose and breathing through your mouth. Why is it important to focus more on breathing through your nose? And is that always the case? Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah absolutely. Our nose is designed for breathing. Yeah, our nose is designed for breathing. It gets the perfect moisture and temperature of air to our lungs. I, I call it in, I call it in breathe in, breathe out. I say it's the bouncer, bouncer for the lungs. I say that the lungs are like a nightclub and, and the nose stops people coming in um, that shouldn't be in. So the nose, yeah, the nose is the first line of defense. 
It filters the air, gets the perfect moisture and temperature to our lungs, so we have optimal absorption. The nose also flushes the air with nitric oxide, which is a, a gas that works as a vasodilator and a bronchodilator. So it basically opens up our blood vessels, which helps improve our circulation. So the nose really gets everything prepared. Now, the size of our nostrils are also a lot smaller than our mouth. So when we're breathing through our nose, the rate at which we breathe is much slower. So when we're breathing through our nose, we start to fall into this slow, gentle pattern of breathing, which is more optimal throughout our day. We feel calmer breathing through our nose. We divert to the mouth breath at times of need. Like I said, the, the gasp of air when we need that sort of instant flick of switch into the stress response. But the nose is really what we want to be using so that we feel calm, relaxed, and uh, everything is kind of falling into place. There's some interesting research around facial development and all, all sorts with nasal breathing. Uh, when we're breathing through our mouth a lot, it can even affect the way our jaw forms and how the palate of the mouth and how much space we have in our mouth. So it's it's more than just breathing that is affected by our nose. And so it's, it's really quite important that we learn to breathe through our nose um, just to get the whole system working effectively. Yeah, I was uh, having a conversation with uh, a dentist. Uh, his name was uh, Dr. Kenny uh, Haas. And uh, he was saying, you know, a lot of the reasons why we have a lot of the health issues we have is that we're breathing into it through our mouth, and that's messing with the microbiome of the mouth. And as a result, it's creating health issues all the way through the system. And so he also encourages to breathe through your nose. A lot of times when people are doing uh, like a meditation, so they'll say, you know, breathe in through your nose and breathe out through your mouth. Is is that not necessarily the right way to do this? Or are there times when that type of response is the right way to go about the out breath particularly? Yeah. So the nose, we, we, I guess we talked about the nose on the in breath. On the out breath, the nose captures moisture and heat leaving the body. So in a lot of meditations or a lot of breath practices, we may wish to breathe in the nose and out the nose, or you may wish to breathe in the nose and out the mouth. You find that breathing in the nose and out the mouth has this lovely relaxation response that happens. It still happens through the nose, but it's as if we still have this activation happening when we're nose, nose, or mouth, mouth. When we breathe in the nose and out the mouth, it kind of impacts this stress, uh, the, the relaxation response and makes us feel nice and calm. All right, so let's let's get into some of these exercises because I think, you know, for many of us the the low hanging fruit is going to be how we can calm ourselves down in a stressful situation like the boss calls your desk and you know, you got to go see them and your heart's just racing cuz you don't know what's going to happen. You've got to calm yourself down before you go into that meeting or another situation being it's the middle of the afternoon and you're just not feeling any energy and you really don't want to go grab a cup of coffee because you know that's going to mess with your sleep. So some breath work that would maybe lift us up in the afternoon so we have the energy to complete our day. Can you talk a little bit about the relaxation breathing and the energized breathing? Yeah, I, my pleasure because it's something that I use so often. And stressful moments, that, that call from the boss when you feel that, it's like the heat just goes woof your heart races, it's the the thought or the anticipation about what that might be, the fear that's kicked in because of that phone call or even seeing their name pop up on the screen triggers the stress response. The tiger is now in the room. So our sympathetic drive is on, heart rate is up, blood pressure is up, our breathing will change. We might freeze our breathing altogether, <laughs> hold on, or we might breathe a lot faster. So the stress response kicked in, the volume of our sympathetic is up. So we simply need to flick the off switch and, and increase the parasympathetic drive. Now, the parasympathetic happens on that out breath. So in those moments, because also what happens in those moments is the fear response closes down our prefrontal cortex in our brain, which is our, our reason. And we go into this sympathetic, the, the, the limbic part of our brain where we're, we're often not able to get that we're ready to fight react. yeah <laughs> the, 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 the answer that we need in those moments so it's really really important and very valid and what i usually say is it starts with the phrase if in doubt breathe it out 
Because in those moments, we might not remember which technique to do. So remember the phrase, if in doubt, breathe it out. Having a nice long drawn out breath. So doubling our out breath to our in breath will allow us to um, increase the parasympathetic response. So that nice long drawn out breath increases the parasympathetic response and we start to relax. So the technique that I go for in those moments is simply in through our nose for a count of four. Feeling our belly rise, we want to be using our diaphragm to breathe as much as possible. Hold our breath for a count of four. And then breathe out through our mouth for a count of eight. And on that out breath, really being mindful of letting the body relax. So we might find in those moments our shoulders are up by our ears and we go out breath. Oh, wow. Relaxed. So it's in for four through the nose, hold for four, then breathe out through the mouth for eight. Increases this parasympathetic response. One cycle, if you're listening, give it a go now, you'll notice a difference in one cycle. The likelihood is in those moments, the brain will jump back in with another thought. And the thought might be, oh my God, the meeting with my boss. So it triggers the body again. So we have this mentioned before, this tug of war that kind of happens in those moments. The thought and the mind triggering the breathing to speed up. So the sympathetic saying, no, we're under alert. And then our conscious mind saying, no, it's okay. I'm in control. In for four, hold for four, out for eight. And that's creating this parasympathetic response. So it takes a bit of practice to get used to it. And it takes more than a couple of rounds just to get used to it. But if we only have one round, that's better than than nothing. The amount of times I've done this in a cab or uh, I've got radio show and sometimes I've, from nowhere, I think I've got it all together and it's just about to go on air. And then it's like the anxiety kicks in and it's straight into in for four, hold four, out for eight. And it just dissipates. It starts to not completely disappear, but it starts to slow down. And you start to feel a bit more relaxed, less overwhelmed, and you can start to just move through those moments a lot easier. Yeah. So our, our Zoom call went down while we were, I was about to ask this particular question and I'm sitting here breathing, like, remember what you read, remember what you read, it'll come back. It'll come back. <laughs> Yeah, the instant instant reaction, isn't it? The yeah. something happens out with our control. Oh my god! And what's that? <clears throat> it's that gasp. It's that contraction, contraction in our breathing, the contraction in our midsection around that solar plexus freezes up, and we move into that stress response. So yeah, coming back in for four, <laughs> over four, out for eight to really relax the body and mind. If we calm our breath, our mind will follow. Okay. So now it's two o'clock in the afternoon. We're starting to have that, that midday lull and we could go in, there's a machine that's going to give me the the sweets and the, all the sugar stuff and the cake stuff and all of that. I can do that cinnamon roll thing and a cup of coffee and I'll be good to go, but I won't sleep well tonight. And I know that. So if I want to bring myself up to finish the day out strong, what's a breathing technique I can do to do that? Yeah. But- well, for this, we want to go the other side, don't we? We want to kind of evoke um, the the sympathetic response. And I'm going to say something that hopefully doesn't scare people, but create stress. Now, when I say stress, stress isn't all bad. We have ooze stress, which is positive stress that will motivate us, which is what happens when you have a coffee anyway. We have this kind of stress in the body. So to evoke this kind of energy flow, we need to breathe a little bit more. So what I tend to do is kind of a double in-breath to an out-breath. And we can even open up the sections. So something like belly, chest, exhale. So belly. So it's a bit quicker there. So belly, chest, exhale. Cool. So just creating a bit more open flow where we've got this natural bigger breath in, opening up those sections. And we can do that a couple of rounds. Try not to sniff hard through your nostrils it's not a real sniff hard through there because we'll get a little bit lightheaded or dizzy it's really driven from the body so we're breathing in belly rises diaphragms engage then the chest and then we're breathing out so we're just opening up the sections of our breath and cr- adding more airflow into our body and kind of shaking things up again the, the body will start to shift and move and the ph changes slightly and, and they can create this energized feeling yeah and i would encourage you to do that standing up 
Yeah, <laughs> or you can do a standing up, sitting yeah. down. It's gonna. Well, uh, I think if you're standing up, it's gonna it's gonna actually let you open up a little bit more. Yeah. Sitting down, you might be a little bit more closed. If you're standing up, you're really gonna be able to bring in that breath and kind of feel yourself get get more energetic. Sometimes you even get the arms moving as well yeah. for it. You can lift your arms up. As there you go in. with some dumbbells or something. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not the dumbbells. You'd be knackered. You'd be exhausted. <laughs> All right. Well, Stuart, I define wellness as being the healthiest, fittest, and happiest you can be. What are three strategies or tactics to get and stay well? Yeah, three tactics. Mine are always pretty simple. I like to keep things simple. The first one we talked about, and I, it has to be my first one because it's what I – has just changed my life and the thousands of people I've worked with is breathe. Use your breath. And that comes with awareness. How am I breathing right now? How am I feeling right now? If I want to change how I feel, change the way you breathe. So breath is the first one. The next thing is, is getting moving. Again, super simple, but the difference we feel once we've moved our body, it will force our breath to move as well. So they go hand in hand, but breathing and moving and then the final one is more about the mind. I like to follow my highest excitement. And when I started doing that, everything started to flow in a positive way. And when I say follow your highest excitement is really with integrity, of course, whether you, know, you get in trouble with following your highest excitement. <laughs> but when you have a decision, sitting with it and feeling into it and saying, well, which actually creates more excitement? And what does that mean in my body? Where can I feel that in my body? So it's this kind of feedback, and all of these have feedback, breathing, awareness, how am I feeling, what do I want to feel, can I use my breath to evoke and help me step towards that movement, or how do I just change the, the state of my body through movement, and then following your highest excitement, creating those moments where you say, well, which will excite me more from a heart-centered place, uh, as opposed to just thinking of excitement. So really making sure that integrity is woven into that. But once we do that, we start to find this flow in our life and it's going to be a really, really effective way to kind of move forward. That was awesome. Stuart, if someone wanted to learn more about you and learn more about your book, Breathe In, Breathe Out, where would you like for me to send them? Well, the best place is, is the website. BreathPod is my business. So www.breathpod.com. And from breathpod.com, that has all the other areas you, you can find out more, whether it's the book, whether it's some of the courses I do, my social media, um, at BreathPod, um, on most channels. So yeah, the website would probably be the easiest place and, and, and Instagram as well, at BreathPod. You can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 570, and I'll be sure to have all the links there. But Stuart, thank you so much for being a part of 40 Plus Fitness. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Remember to breathe. <laughs> Absolutely. Welcome back, Ras. Hey, Alan. Well, just give me a second. I need to take a deep breath. <laughs> whenever we talk about breathing or whenever I listen to a podcast about it or, or read about it, I always feel compelled to take some deep breaths. It's very calming. It is very relaxing. Yeah. Well, you got to try reading a whole book. Um, <laughs> wow. Because I, I, what I've found is when I, when I think about my breath, I try mm -hmm. to control my breath. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like, I can't just let myself, you know, I say, just breathe. Like you're doing a meditation. <laughs> right. that never happens that way. No. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm always, if I'm thinking, about, if you say breath, I'm mm -hmm. thinking about breath and I'm either mm -hmm. going to try to breathe better, you know, because, uh, you know, just, it just is what it is. It's how my brain is wired. Is if mm -hmm. you draw attention to something, I'm going. I'm going to control it. Same. Uh, <laughs> yep. Same here. <laughs> Which yep. means, yeah, yeah. When I'm running, I'm I'm trying to control my breath because that's mm -hmm. a part of managing my heart rate and not overextending. So when I run, I try to manage my breath. When I'm mm -hmm. talking, you know, podcasting, I have to control my breath. It's the only mm -hmm. way you get the voice you're supposed to get right. without getting all squeaky whiny because you didn't breathe enough. <laughs> you know. So. Yes. Yep. <laughs> so yeah. But, but what was cool was how much he's learned and he's willing, he's sharing in his book about how the breath controls us. It does. As much as we control the breath. And so right. you can use breath as a way of relaxing and controlling yourself. You can use breath as a way of getting yourself energized and moving. Mm -hmm. And in his case, when he really became aware 
of the power of breath was letting go of trauma and letting go of past pain mm-hmm. and finding himself in a place where it basically opened him up to heal. Right. Well, as you know, this has been kind of a stressful year for my husband and I with his cancer diagnosis. And every time that we've gone to a a CAT scan or an infusion or something, you know, I I do feel the tension. I feel it in my shoulders. I get it in my my neck and um, I can't concentrate. I can't think I can't do anything for some time. And so if I can just sit and practice something similar to that box breathing technique, couple deep breaths in, couple deep breaths out. It really does a, a world of difference to help me calm down, breathe deeper, breathe fuller and, and relax into it a little bit so that I can think straight and deal with the yeah. situation at hand. It is definitely a great tool. Yeah. And, and, and there've been moments where, you know, anxiety just washes over yes. me and I'm like, holy crap, you know, and right. I'm just going to complete panic. Yes. I'm, I'm incapable of doing normal stuff because I'm mm-hmm. just so uh, tense. And, yeah. yeah. And then so just having a tool to be able to let that go is really, mm-hmm. really important. Yeah. And, you know, I've always heard of breathing techniques for the purpose of relaxing, for, for getting that parasympathetic system going. But I never really thought about using it to get amped. Instead of reaching for the yeah. cup of coffee in the afternoon, I, I never thought to do a different breathing technique to in, encourage energy instead of relaxation. Yeah. And so there's two, the two systems, you know, there's sympathetic, which mm-hmm. is the relaxation. Mm-hmm. The oh, parasympathetic right. is the, the, the bounce up. up. <laughs> yeah, the yes. up. Yeah. And so you, when you find yourself breathing heavy, you're stressed mm-hmm. out and you're breathing heavy. You're literally firing up your parasympathetic, parasympathetic. <laughs> uh, fight or flight mode. It's mm-hmm. like literally you, you ready to fight. Now mm-hmm. there are times when that's appropriate, you know, yeah. um, you got to run after something, do something. You need that energy. Mm-hmm. It's obviously appropriate, but we use it when it's not necessarily appropriate. Um, mm-hmm. And as a result, we, we can't keep ourselves in the, in the frame of mind to do the right things because it mm-hmm. turns the brain off. It's like, right. no, we've got two things to do here. We're going to fight or flight. And I'll tell you, if you punch <laughs> your boss, it. You're in trouble. That's a bad day. Uh, that's a bad day. Um, and and so unless you just really need to punch your boss and you didn't need that job <laughs> or the next one, um, that would be bad. You're ready to retire. Pop. Yeah, yeah. it's done. Um, <laughs> but um, just make sure you sign the paper so you are getting your pension. Um, right. But <laughs> anyway, um, you know there are going to be times when you need to calm down, and probably mm-hmm. in our current environment, there's more times that you need to calm down than you mm-hmm. need to amp up. But right. yes, in the, in the afternoons, you find yourself lulling uh, rather than hitting the caffeine, knowing that that's probably going to disturb your sleep a little bit. Mm-hmm. Just take in some deep breaths. Give your body the oxygen. Oxygen is the energy for fire. We know that you can't have a fire without oxygen. Your body is no different. If you don't mm-hmm. have, if you bring in extra oxygen you're going to stoke the fire. It's it's kind of the same chemistry that's going on when you have a, a campfire and you have the little billow thing and you're, ch- mm-hmm. ch- you know, you're amp up the fire. It has yeah. to have the oxygen. I love that. And then at night when it's time to wind things down and, and try and lay down and fall asleep, taking those deeper breaths and, and having a little bit more relaxing or relaxation could help you fall asleep faster. Yeah. The, the slow breathes out, you know, Mm -hmm. just let it, let it out just slow and easy. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the settle down. That's the, that's you telling your body, okay, there's nothing to worry about. Just chill, sleep. Stripped off. Yep. (laughs) Go back to sleep. It's important. We need our sleep. We do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, Raz, I'll, I'll see you next week. Great. Take care, Alan. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Now, before you forget, Head over to Better Me Tomorrow so you can join us on the Better Me Tomorrow workshop I'm hosting on the afternoon of January 1st. Truth be told, there's only one reason you've struggled to lose weight, have more confidence, have more energy, look and feel better, and fit into the clothes you love. And until you deal with this one thing, you'll probably stay stuck. But if you'll join me on January 1st for the Better Me Tomorrow workshop, I'll take you step by step through a process to develop a personalized plan to eliminate the one thing that is holding you back. Make 2023 your year of transformation. 
Learn more at bettermetomorrow.com. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we discuss how to get going and keep going on your fitness goals. Until then, have a happy and healthy week.